Joyce, Mallarmé, and the Press. Declining to write for the Revue Européenne in 1831, Lamartine said to its editor, Do not perceive in these words a superb disdain for what is termed journalism. Far from it. I have too intimate a knowledge of my epoch to repeat this absurd nonsense, this impertinent inanity against the periodical press. I know too well the work Providence has committed to it. Before this century shall run out, journalism will be the whole press, the whole human thought. Since that prodigious multiplication which art has given to speech, multiplication to be multiplied a thousandfold yet, mankind will write their books day by day, hour by hour, page by page. Thought will be spread abroad in the world with the rapidity of light, instantly conceived, instantly written, instantly understood at the extremities of the earth. It will spread from pole to pole. Sudden, instant, burning with the fervor of soul which made it burst forth. It will be the reign of the human soul in all its plenitude. It will not have time to ripen, to accumulate in a book. The book will arrive too late. The only book possible from today is a newspaper. It is strange that the popular press as an art form has often attracted the enthusiastic attention of poets and aesthetes while rousing the gloomiest apprehensions in the academic mind. The same division of opinion can be traced in the 16th century concerning the printed book. 2,000 years of manuscript culture were abruptly dissolved by the printing press. Failure to understand this arises from various overriding assumptions about the universal benefits of print. But today, when technology has conferred ascendancy on pictorial and radio communication, it is easy to detect the peculiar limitations and bias of the four-century span of book culture, which is coming to a close. In her recent study of George Herbert, Rosamund Tuve stressed the extent to which metaphysical conceits were direct translations into verbal terms of popular pictorial imagery of the late Middle Ages. She was able to show that the characteristic conceits of Herbert and others arose from the meeting of the old manuscript culture, with its marginal pictures, and the new printed medium. In the same way, many others have argued that the particular richness of effect of Elizabethan and Jacobean language was the result of a meeting of the oral tradition and the new printed culture. Mere literature doesn't begin until the oral tradition was entirely subordinated to the silent and private studies of the bookman. It was the lifelong claim of W.B. Yeats that, in Ireland, this conquest over the spoken word was less complete than elsewhere in Anglo-Saxony. So, if the metaphysicals owe much to their adaptation of medieval pictographs to the printed medium, it could be suggested that modern poetry, with its elaborate mental landscapes, owes much to the new pictorial technology which fascinated Poe and Baudelaire, and on which Rambeau and Mallarmé built much of their aesthetics. If the Jacobeans were receding from a pictographic culture towards the printed page, may we not meet them at the point where we are receding from the printed word under the impetus of pictorial technology. Manuscript technology fostered a constellation of mental attitudes and skills of which the modern world has no memory. Plato foresaw some of them with alarm in the Phaedrus. The specific which you have discovered is an aid not to memory, but to reminiscence. And you give your disciples not truth, but only the semblance of truth. They will be hearers of many things and will have learned nothing. They will appear omniscient and will generally know nothing. They will be tiresome company, having the show of wisdom without the reality. Plato is speaking for the oral tradition before it was modified by literacy. He saw writing as a mainly destructive revolution. Since then, we have been through enough revolutions to know that every medium of communication is a unique art form, which gives salience to one set of human possibilities at the expense of another set. Each medium of expression profoundly modifies human sensibility in mainly unconscious and unpredictable ways. Alphabetic communication brings about an inevitable psychic withdrawal, as E.J. Chater showed in From Script to Print with a train of personal and social maladjustments. But, 
it secures a host of advantages. Psychic withdrawal is automatic because the process of literacy is the process of setting up the interior monologue. It is the problem of translation of the auditory into the visual and back again, which is the process of writing and reading that brings the interior monologue into existence, as can be observed in the study of pre-literate cultures today. This introversion, with its consequent weakening of sense perception, also creates inattention to the speech of others and sets up mechanisms which interfere with verbal recall. Exact verbal recall is scarcely a problem for pre-literate cultures. Throughout Finnegan's Wake, Joyce plays some of his major variations on this theme of ABC-mindedness in those pagan ironed times of the first city when a frond was a friend. His verbivo co visual presentation of an all-night's newsery reel is the first dramatization of the very media of communication as both form and vehicle of the flux of human cultures. Most of the problems of reading the wake dissolve when it is seen that he is using the media themselves as art forms, as in a phantom city faked of film folk. The lights go up in his Phoenix Playhouse, as the sun dips at the end of the Anna Livia section, and he is ready to mime the war of light and dark, of Michael, the devil, and the Maggies, in a zodiacal dance of the witches, montage, with nightly redistribution of parts and players by the puppetry producer. Throughout the wake, this interior tabloid, or tale of a tub, is linked both to the Kabbalistic significance of the letters of the alphabet and to the psychological effect of literacy in creating a general ABC-mindedness in human society. But the arrest of the flux of thought and speech, which is the written page, permits that prolonged analysis of thought processes from which arises the structures of science. Pictographic Chinese culture, for example, would seem to stand midway between the extremes of our abstract written tradition and the plenary oral tradition, with its stress on speech as gesture, and gesture as phatic communion. And it is perhaps this medial position between the non-communicating extremes of print and pictorial technology which attracts us today to the Chinese ideogram. A principal feature of manuscript culture was its relative unity. The rarity and inaccessibility of manuscript books fostered a habit of encyclopedism. And where scholars were not numerous, there were additional reasons for each of them to be acquainted with the entire range of authors. Moreover, manuscripts were studied slowly and aloud. Silent reading was impossible until the presses created the macadamized highways of print. The handwritten book was a broken road, which was travelled slowly and infrequently. It kept the reader close to the dimensions of oral discourse. The publication of a poem consisted in reading or reciting it to a small audience. The promulgation of ideas was by public disputation. Print multiplied scholars, but it also diminished their social and political importance. And it did the same for books. Unexpectedly, print fostered nationalism and broke down international communication because publishers found that the vernacular audience was larger and more profitable. As H.A. Innes has shown in The Bias of Communication, the printed word has been a major cause of international disturbance and misunderstanding since the 16th century. But pictorial communication is relatively international and hard to manipulate for purposes of national rivalry. H.A. Innes has been the great pioneer in opening up the study of the economic and social consequences of the various media of communication so that today any student of letters is necessarily indebted to him for insight into changing attitudes to time and space, which result from shifting media. In particular, his studies of the newspaper as a major branch of the technology of print are relevant to the study of modern literature. Beginning as an economic historian, Innes was gradually impelled to consider not just the external trade routes of the world, but also the great trade routes of the mind. He became aware that the modern world, having solved the problem of commodities, had turned its technology to the packaging of information and ideas. If the manuscript tradition encouraged encyclopedism, book culture naturally tended to specialism. 
there were enough books to make reading a full-time occupation and to ensure an entirely withdrawn and private existence for the whole class of bookmen. Eventually, there were enough books to splinter the reading public into dozens of non-communicating groups. This has meant a large degree of unawareness in our culture of the meaning and drift of its most obvious developments. The bookman, as such, is not easily interested even in the technology and art of the book form of communication. And as this form has been modified by the popular press and later developments, the exponents of book culture have registered various emotions but little curiosity. It is not, therefore, incongruous that real understanding of the changes in modern communication should have come mainly from the resourceful technicians among modern poets and painters. Much of the novelty of the portrait, Ulysses, and the wake is an illusion resulting from inattention to technical developments in the arts since Newton. That manipulation of a continuous parallel between modern Dublin and ancient Ithaca, which Mr. Eliot has noted as the major resource of Ulysses, was a transfer to the time dimension of a double plot, a technique which had been the staple of all picturesque art for 200 years. De Gourmont observed that one achievement of Flaubert had been the transfer of Chateaubriand's panoramic art from nature and history to the industrial metropolis. And Baudelaire had matched Flaubert in this witty reversal of the role of picturesque landscape. But English landscape art in painting, poetry and the novel was decades in advance of France and Europe, a fact which was inseparable from English industrial experiment and scientific speculation. In her fascinating book, Newton Demands the Muse, Marjorie Nicholson records the impact of Newtonian optics on the themes of the poets. But the techniques of rendering experience were equally modified in the direction of an inclusive image of society and consciousness. The new vision of space and light as outer phenomena, which were precisely correlative to our inner faculties, gave a new meaning and impetus to the juxtaposition of images and experiences. The taste for the discontinuities of Gothic art was one with the new interest in the juxtaposition of various social classes in the novels of The Road, Fielding, Smollett, Mackenzie, and in the juxtaposition of historical epochs as well as primitive and sophisticated experience in Scott and Byron. More subtle was the juxtaposition of various states of the same mind in Tristram Shandy, and the sleuth-like quest for the origins of such states on the part of Stern and later of Wordsworth. But the parallel development of the arts of spatial manipulation of mental states, which was occurring in the popular press, has been given no attention. Innes has shown how the new global landscapes of the press were not only geared to industry, but were themselves the means of paying for new roads, for railway and telegraph and cable. The physical landscape of the earth was changed very quickly by the landscapes of the newspaper, even though the political scene has not yet caught up. The networks of news, trade and transport were one, and newspaper men like Dickens, who had no stake in established literary decorum, were quick to adapt the technology of print to art and entertainment. Well before the French Impressionists and Symbolists had discovered the bearings for art of modern technology, Dickens had switched the picturesque perspectives of the 18th century novel to the representation of the new industrial slums. Neurotic eccentricity in the sub-world of the metropolis, he proved to be a much richer source for the rendering of mania and manic states of mind than the crofters of Scott or the yokels of Wordsworth. And Dostoevsky mined from Dickens freely, as G.B. Shaw did later still. But just how valid were the impressionist techniques of the picturesque kind familiar to the news reporter appears in the notable essay of Eisenstein in film form, where he shows the impact of Dickens on the art of D.W. Griffiths. How deeply English artists had understood the principles of picturesque art by 1780 appears from the invention of cinema at that time. In 1781, de Lutherbourg, the theatrical scene painter, contrived in London a panorama which he called the Eidufusikon, so as to realise pictures in all four dimensions. His various imitations of natural phenomena, represented by moving pictures, were advertised in these words and caused a sensation. Gainsborough, we are told by a contemporary, was so delighted that for a time he thought of nothing else, talked of nothing else, and passed his evenings at the exhibition in long succession. 
He even made one of these machines for himself, capable of showing sunrise and moonrise, as well as storms and ships at sea. Gainsborough, through this cinema, was experiencing the novelty of cubism with Lo Spettatore nel Centro del Quadro. Another familiar instance of the abrupt newspaper juxtaposition of events in picturesque perspective is The Ring in the Book, an explicitly newspaperish crime report given as a series of inside stories, each one contained within another like Chinese boxes. But it was Mallarmé who formulated the lessons of the press as a guide for the new impersonal poetry of suggestion and implication. He saw that the scale of modern reportage and of the mechanical multiplication of messages made personal rhetoric impossible. Now was the time for the artist to intervene in a new way and to manipulate the new media of communication by a precise and delicate adjustment of the relations of words, things, and events. His task had become not self-expression, but the release of the life in things. Un coup de day illustrates the road he took in the exploitation of all things as gestures of the mind, magically adjusted to the secret powers of being. As a vacuum tube is used to shape and control vast reservoirs of electric power, the artist can manipulate the low current of casual words, rhythms and resonances to evoke the primal harmonies of existence, or to recall the dead. But the price he must pay is total self-abnegation. The existentialist metaphysic latent in Mallarmé's aesthetics was stated in 1924 in In Praise of Newspapers by Carol Capek. The newspaper world, like that of the wild beasts, exists solely in the present. Press consciousness, if one can speak of consciousness, is circumscribed by simple present time, extending from the morning on to the evening edition, or the other way around. If you read a paper a week old, you feel as if you were turning the pages of Dalamil's Chronicle. No longer is it a newspaper, but a memorial. The ontological system of newspapers is actualized realism. What is just now exists. Literature is the expression of old things in eternally new forms, while newspapers are eternally expressing new realities in a stabilized and unchangeable form. By extending the technique of reporting the coexistence of events in China and Peru from global space to the dimension of time, Joyce achieved the actualized realism of a continuous present for events past, present and future. In reverse, it is only necessary to remove the dateline from any newspaper to obtain a similar, if less satisfactory, model of the universe. That is what R. L. Stevenson meant when he said he could make an epic of a newspaper if he knew what to leave out. Joyce knew what to leave out. For that school of thought for which the external world is an opaque prison, art can never be regarded as a source of knowledge, but only as a moral discipline and a study of endurance. The artist is not a reader of radiant signatures on materia signata, but the signer of a forged check on our hopes and sympathies. This school has supported the idea of the function of art as catharsis, which, as G. R. Levy shows in The Gate of Horn, was a preparation for the lesser Greek mysteries. But if the world is not opaque, and if the mind is not of the earth earthy, then this moral view of art should yield to the cognitive view. However that may be, the cathartic, ethical view of art has led to a doctrinaire hostility to the use of discontinuity in art the theme of Arnold's preface to Poems, 1853, and indifference to all popular art. And in the past century, with every technological device advancing the discontinuous character of communication, the stand taken by the cathartic and ethical school has enveloped the entire world of popular culture in a haze of esoteric nescience, disguised, however, as a profound moral concern with the wider hope and the higher things. Joyce had a phrase for this anti-cognitive attitude, the cultic toilet. Moral and aesthetic horror at the ignobility of the popular scene gave way to an opposite attitude in the symbolists, and Mallarmé is, before Joyce, the best spokesman of the new approach. In his shop windows, étalage, while analysing the aesthetics of commercial layout, he considers the relations between poetry and the press. A shop window full of new books prompts his reflection that the function of the ordinary run of books is merely to express the average decree of human boredom and incompetence, 
to reduce to a written form the horizon of the human scene in all its abounding banality. Instead of deploring this fact, as literary men tend to do, the artist should exploit it. The vague, the commonplace, the smudged and defaced, not banishment of these, occupation rather, apply them as to a patrimony. Only by a conquest and occupation of these vast territories of stupefaction can the artist fulfill his culturally heroic function of purifying the dialect of the tribe, the Herculean labor of cleaning the Augean stables of speech, of thought and feeling. Turning directly to the press, Mallarmé designates it as a traffic, an epitomization of enormous and elementary interests, employing print for the propagation of opinions, the recital of diverse facts, made plausible in the press, which is devoted to publicity, by the omission, it would seem, of any art. He delights in the dramatic significance of the fact that in the French press, at least, the literary and critical features form a section at the base of the first page. And even more delightful... Fiction, properly so called, or the imaginative tale, frolics across the average daily paper, enjoying the most prominent spots, even to the top of the page, dislodging the financial feature and pushing actuality into second place. Here, too, is the suggestion and even the lesson of a certain beauty. That today is not only the supplanter of yesterday or the presager of tomorrow, but issues from time, in general, with an integrity bathed and fresh. The vulgar placard, bold, at the street corner, thus sustains this reflection on the political text. Such experience leaves some people cold because they imagine that while there may be a little more or less of the sublime in these pleasures tasted by the people, the situation as regards that which alone is precious and immeasurably lofty, and which is known by the name of poetry, that this situation remains unchanged. Poetry, they suppose, will always be exclusive, and the beat of its pinions will never approach those pages of the newspaper where it is parodied, nor are they pleased by the spread of wings in our hands of those vast improvised sheets of the daily paper. Mallarmé is laughing at these finicky and unperceptive people for whom the press appears as a threat to real culture, and continues, to gauge by the extraordinary actual superproduction through which the press intelligently yields its average, the notion prevails, nonetheless, of something very decisive which is elaborating itself, a prelude to an era a competition for the foundation of the popular modern poem, at the very least of innumerable thousand and one nights, by which the majority of readers will be astonished at the sudden invention. You are assisting at a celebration. All of you, right now, admits the contingencies of this lightning achievement. The author of Ulysses was the only person to grasp the full artistic implications of this radically democratic aesthetic elaborated by the fabulous artificer, the modern Daedalus. Stéphane Mallarmé. But Joyce was certainly assisted by Flaubert's sentimental education and Bouvard and Pécuchet in adapting Mallarmé's insights to his own artistic purposes. A very little reflection on the scrupulously banal character of Flaubert's epics about industrial man illuminates much of the procedure in Ulysses and the Wake. Christ de Verre, Étalage and Le Livre, Instrument Spirituel, all belong to the last few years of Mallarmé's life, representing his ultimate insights, 1892 to 1896. And in each of these essays, he is probing the aesthetic consequences and possibilities of the popular arts of industrial man. In Le Livre, he turns to scrutinize the press once more, opening with the proposition, self-evident to him, that the whole world exists in order to result in a book. This is a matter of metaphysical fact, that all existence cries out to be raised to the level of scientific or poetic intelligibility. In this sense, the book confers on things and persons another mode of existence which helps to perfect them. And it is plain that Mallarmé regarded the press as this ultimate encyclopedic book in its most rudimentary form. The almost superhuman range of awareness of the press now awaits only the full analogical sense of exact orchestration to perfect its present juxtaposition of items and themes. And this implies the complete self-effacement of the writer, for this book does not admit of any signature. The job of the artist is not to sign, but to read signatures. Existence must speak for itself. It is already richly and radiantly signed. The artist has merely to reveal, not to forge the signatures of existence. But he can only put these in order by discovering the orchestral analogies in things themselves. The result will be the hymn, harmony, and joy as a pure ensemble ordered in the sharpest and most vivid circumstance of their interrelations. 
Man charged with divine vision has no other mode of expression save the parallelism of pages as a means of expressing the links, the whims, the limpidity on which he gazes. All those pseudo-rationalisms, the forged links and fraudulent intelligibility which official literature has imposed on existence, must be abandoned. And this initial step the press has already taken in its style of impersonal juxtaposition, which conveys such riches to the writer. This work of popular enchantment, which is the daily paper, is not lacking in moral edification, for the hubbub of appetites and protests to be found among the advertisements and announcements proclaims each day the original servitude of man and the confusion of tongues of the Tower of Babel. But the very format of the press resembles a retracted wing which is ready to spread itself, awaiting only the intervention of folding or of rhythm, in order to rid us of all that passes for literature. Mallarmé sees this impersonal art of juxtaposition as revolutionary and democratic, also in the sense that it enables each reader to be an artist. Reading becomes a solitary, tacit concert given to itself by the mind, which recaptures significance from the least sonorities. It is the rhyming and orchestrating of things themselves which releases the maximum intelligibility and attunes the ears of men once more to the music of the spheres. We are finished, he says, with that custom of an official literary decorum by which poets sang in chorus, obliterating with their personal forgeries the actual signatures of things. In fact, the new poet will take as much care to avoid a style that is not in things themselves as literary men have in the past sought to achieve and impose one. In approaching the structure of Ulysses as a newspaper landscape, it is well to call to mind a favourite book of Joyce's, The Purple Island of Phineas Fletcher, the author's name suggesting Finn the Arrow Maker. Fletcher presents the anatomy and labyrinths of the human body in terms of an enchanted Spencerian landscape. Many have pointed out the importance of the human form of the sleeping giant, the collective consciousness as the structure of the wake. And Joyce was careful to instruct his readers in the relation between the episodes of Ulysses and our bodily organs. In 1844, the American press greeted the telegraph as the first definite pulsation of the real nervous system of the world. In Ulysses, in episode 7, we find ourselves in a newspaper office in the heart of the Hibernian metropolis. For Joyce, the press was indeed a microchasm of the world of man its columns unchanging monuments to the age-old passions and interests of all men, and its production and distribution a drama involving the hands and organs of the entire body politic. With its dateline, June 16th, 1904, Ulysses is, newspaper-wise, an abridgment of all space in a brief segment of time, as the wake is a condensation of all time in the brief space of Howth Castle and environs. The dateline of Ulysses, the day of the end of the drought in the land of the dead, the day of the meeting of Joyce and Nora Barnacle, was the day that Joyce was to preserve in exile, as Aeneas carried to New Troy the ashes and hut urn of his ancestors. Fustel de Coulanges, the ancient city, is a useful introduction to this aspect of Joyce's filial piety. But whereas the techniques of the wake are telekinetic and are explicitly specified as those of radio, television, newsreel, and the stuttering verbal gestures of HCE, it is the newspaper as seen by Mallarmé that provides most of the symbolist landscapes of Ulysses. As a daily cross-section of the activities and impulses of the race, the press is an inclusive image affording possibilities of varied orchestration. A passage in Stephen Hero suggests the direction in which Joyce has modified the superficial cross-section of the popular press. The modern spirit is vivisective. Vivisection itself is the most modern process one can conceive. All modern political and religious criticism dispenses with presumptive states. It examines the entire community in action and reconstructs the spectacle of redemption. If you were an aesthetic philosopher, you would take note of all my vagaries, because here you have the spectacle of the aesthetic instinct in action. The philosophic college should spare a detective for me. The key terms here, vivisection, community in action, reconstruction, detection, are related to every phase of Joyce's aesthetic. In Modern Painters, Ruskin discusses the discontinuous picturesque techniques in medieval and modern art, under the term grotesque, 
noting it as the avenue by which popular and democratic expression enters the serious levels of art. A fine grotesque is the expression, in a moment, by a series of symbols thrown together in bold and fearless connection of truths which it would have taken a long time to express in any verbal way, and of which the connection is left for the beholder to work out for himself. The gaps, left or overlapped by the haste of the imagination, forming the grotesque character. Hence, it is an infinite good to mankind when there is a full acceptance of the grotesque. An enormous amount of intellectual power is turned to use, which in this present century of ours evaporates in street driving. It is with a view to the reopening of this great field of human intelligence, long entirely closed, that I am striving to introduce Gothic architecture and to revive the art of illumination. The distinctive difference between illumination and painting proper being that illumination admits no shadows, but only gradations of pure colour. Ruskin, in describing the grotesque, gives the very formula for vivisection, or the community in action, though he hadn't the faintest idea of how to adapt this ideal to contemporary art. It was not misleading on Joyce's part, therefore, when he spoke of his work as a Gothic cathedral, or of the wake as an activated page of the Book of Kells. In presenting history as her is harped, Joyce concludes, and so the triptych vision passes out of a hillside into a hillside, fair she fading. Again am I delicated by the picaresqueness of your images. It is the Mallarmean method of orchestration of the qualities of ordinary speech and experience that recurs again and again in the wake. To inform the old sniggering publicing press and its nation of sheep copers about the whole plighty troth between them, malady of milady, made melody of malody, she, the lalage of lionesses, and him, her knave errant, for all within crystal range. The last crystal image gives the typical translation of the auditory into the visual, music into colour, the harp of Aeolus into the map of Memnon, time into space which is the kind of metamorphosis which is going on everywhere in the wake. But the world of Ulysses, being primarily a modulation of space, is relatively static and newspaperish in its landscapes. It stands as inferno to the purgatorio of the wake. However, in the Aeolus section of Ulysses, which is governed specifically by the organ lungs and the art of rhetoric, everything, as Bloom says, speaks for itself. The sheets of the newspaper become the tree harp for the wind of rhetoric and the tree harp of the newspaper office is appropriately located beside the rock pillar of the hero. Before Nelson's pillar, trams glowed, shunted, changed trolley, started for Blackrock. The trams, with their rows of cast steel, provide a parallel network to the linotype machines and the rows of printed matter. But if the tree and pillar provide the true image of a hero cult, the rhetoric that blows through the leaves of this tree is that of an alien speech. Much is made of this contretemps throughout the episode, and the climax brings this dramatic conflict to an issue. J.J. O'Malloy recites John F. Taylor's defense of the Gaelic revival, the theme of which is the mosaic refusal to accept the gods and cult of the dominant Egyptians, a refusal which made possible his descent from Sinai, bearing in his arms the tables of the law graven in the image of the outlaw. This passage, the only one Joyce seems to have recorded from Ulysses, has an obvious bearing on the relation of his own art to English culture. In his Dialogue de l'Arbe, Valéry expounds the Aeolian cosmology of trees, roots, trunks, branches, leaves. Chacun dit son nom, au l'un confus, l'un qui t'agite, je veux foudre toutes tes voix. Cent mille feuilles me font ce que le rêveur murmure au puisson du son. And he proceeds to contemplate the tree as a labyrinth merging with river and sea, yet remaining a giant. In the same way, the Aeolian tree music of the press re emerges with the mosaic eloquence of Sinai and the mountain, just as Anna Livia is also ALP, and Aeolus was a volcano spirit, that is, a cyclopean or mountain figure. He was the reputed father of Ulysses, and hence of Bloom. The Cyclopean aspect of Aeolus and the press provides an important motif, that of crime detection and the private eye. The press man, as a Sean the Cop or Cyclops type, though he might have been more humble, there's no police like Holmes, is presented in this episode as a parody or ape of the artist. 
editor Miles Crawford, soliciting the services of Stephen, boasts of the sleuthing feats of We'll Paralyze Europe, Ignatius Gallagher. Gallagher's idea of scare journalism is paralysis, as opposed to the artist's idea of awakening. Gallagher reconstructs the pattern of the Phoenix Park murders to paralyze Europe. The artist reconstructs the crime of history as a means of awakening the dead. As bullock-befriending Bard Stephen is the threader of that labyrinth described by Virgil in the Fourth Georgic, the fable of the ox and of the bees of poetic inspiration. Nevertheless, Joyce is not questioning the parallel between journalism and art in respect to the retracing process. The very conditions of journalism fostered insight into artistic production, because daily or periodic publication led to a great deal of serial composition. This, in turn, compelled authors to write their stories backwards. Edgar Poe, a journalist, in The Philosophy of Composition, begins, Charles Dickens, in a note now lying before me, alluding to an examination I once made of the mechanism of Barnaby Rudge, says, By the way, are you aware that Godwin wrote his Kayla Williams backwards? Poe then develops the familiar symbolist doctrine of the poem as an art situation, which is the formula for a particular effect. The same method of composition in reverse enabled Poe to pioneer the detective story. There is nothing accidental, therefore, about the Aeolus episode being crammed with instances of reversal, and reconstruction. Applying the same principle to language yields, in the wake, a reconstruction of all the layers of culture and existence embedded in the present forms of words and speech gesture. It was natural that 18th century writers should have been attracted to the retracing and reconstruction principle of art, which made Horace Walpole say of Tristram Shandy that it was the first book which consists in the whole narrative going backwards. A little later, Dr. Thomas Brown of Edinburgh argued that the poet's imagination differed from the ordinary man's by the power of reversing the direction of association. Once picturesque art, following the spectroscope, had broken up the continuum of linear art and narrative, the possibility of cinematic montage emerged at once. And montage has to be arranged forwards or backwards. Forwards, it yields narrative. Backwards, it is reconstruction of events. Arrested, it consists of the static landscape of the press, the coexistence of all aspects of community life. This is the image of the city presented in Ulysses.